My career has had a number of turning points. Uh, the first was when I finished my PhD at UCL uh, and I was looking for a job. Uh, it turns out that uh, expertise in the uh, interaction of uh, coastally trapped waves and topography really isn't a very marketable quantity. Um, and so I was looking for a job and I uh, was, you know, people who knew people and, uh, and I, I, I called a professor in Montreal and. Uh, and he said, oh, you yeah, know, we're, we're looking for somebody, um, but we, we're, we're studying this whole new thing in climate. And I'm going, oh, well, that sounds very interesting. He says, yeah, we're going we're to be modeling the, uh, the thermohaline circulation. And I said, oh, yes, that's, that's very important. Um, and I remember instantly putting down the phone uh, after, after that conversation and then turning to my supervisor saying, what is the thermohaline circulation? <laughs> And, uh, but it worked out very nicely. I, I, I ended up in uh, Montreal, I, uh, you know, and did a lot of um, kind of introductory stuff on climate. I, I took some more courses and started working on the thermohaline circulation. And then it, was, uh, then it was like, oh, this is actually very interesting. And one of the things that I realized um, was that in moving from a mathematician, which is what I had been, to a climate scientist, the amount of interest that people had in your work uh, increased enormously. <laughs> um, and so instead of uh, people going to, uh, uh, you know, talking to me at parties and I tell them what I did, oh, I'm a mathematician, it's like, oh, okay. You know, and then suddenly, oh, I'm doing stuff about the ocean, I'm doing stuff about climate. And then it's like, oh, tell me more. That's really interesting. And as I found, as I did things that were more relevant to things that people can see and feel uh, all around them or hear about in the news, uh, people were more and more interested in the kinds of research that you were doing. And I was thinking, well, how can you make it more interesting? What is it, what is it that r people are actually interested in? And so I found my career moving towards, um, uh, uh, moving towards realistic uh, issues, away from abstraction, away from mathematics to things that are much more not necessarily applied, but, uh, but much uh, less uh, obtuse and abstract, but much more kind of real. Right? What's happening on the real earth? What's happening uh, uh, on these, these real environmental issues? Not what's happening on a spherical cow. So that, that's a very interesting question. That, so some people uh, come into climate and it's because you know, they've always wanted to know something about the climate. And to be frank, you know, I, I grew up and all I loved was doing mathematics and that's all I wanted to do and I really didn't care whether it was practical or useful or, or anything else. And so my transition to, you know, a physicist and then a climate physicist and now, a, you know, a climate scientist in the round uh, has, has, has kind of developed over that time uh, very much uh, in response to, you know, interesting questions and uh, interesting reactions to the work that I've done. And how has your time at GIS evolved? You mentioned you've been there 18 years. Mm -hmm. What's happened in that time? So over the last 18 years that I've been at GIS, uh, there's been a number of actually very interesting, well not quite revolutions, but evolutions in how we go about trying to understand the world. Um, computers have got a lot faster, uh, and so that allows us to do things in more detail. Uh, but we've also spent a lot of time kind of connecting realms that, that weren't really connected. So 18 years ago, we were really only just starting to do coupled models. So those, those are models that have the atmosphere and the ocean all interacting all at the same time. And, you know, and then we added in sea ice right, uh, around the Arctic and around Antarctica, and then land surface processes, and now uh, aerosols, small atmospheric particles, and atmospheric chemistry, and the chemistry of the ozone layer, and the chemistry of, of uh, um, acid rain, and air pollution, and all of those things are now incorporated and embedded within the same models. And so we end up in a situation now where we can ask much more interesting questions uh, of the models than we were able to do 10 or 15 years ago, right? So when somebody said, 
oh, well, we're going to change this policy, we're going to change these standards, what impact is that going to have on you know, air pollution or climate or public health? You know, 15 years ago, those were five different questions that you'd have to farm off to five different sets of experts and they wouldn't be coherent. Now you can start off with a tool that provides uh, almost all of those answers directly and then you can kind of downstream uh, all the rest of the consequences. And that's a, that, that's a very powerful tool for making answers that are policy relevant um, far more coherent than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So that's, that's, a, real, uh, that's a real change. So I have a very eclectic um, view of, of climate, and I've worked on, uh, on issues uh, that date from you know, uh, prehistoric climates in the Cretaceous to you know, things that were changing during the Little Ice Age or the medieval warm period to uh, what's going on right now in the 20th century, what's going to be happening in the future, and then how to build credibility in the models and the tools that we're using. And so I've got... Um, I've been having meetings with people to discuss uh, paleoclimate modeling, uh, to discuss uh, model building and model development and how we go about that in a way that's uh, transparent and that you know, we can share among the different groups. So the Met Office uh, has one of the best uh, climate models in the world. Uh, we have another one and there's, you know, there's another dozen of these models around. But in fact, we don't actually share very much information about how we go about building these models, uh, even amongst ourselves. And I think we need to be much more um, open uh, and transparent about that, just so that we understand what, what people have adjusted, what people have, uh, uh, have calibrated against, so that we don't uh, accidentally think that somebody's model is doing a really good job uh, for the wrong reasons. This is a new thing uh, where they brought in people to have a kind of week-long um, multimodal uh, visit uh, for, for visitors. Um, uh, apparently they had a vote uh, to decide who was going to be their first distinguished visitor and apparently I won, uh, which is kind of weird, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I didn't even campaign. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know uh, really how that came about, but I think it's a great idea. And so uh, when they asked me, I was very flattered to, to come uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've spent time uh, at the Met Office when it was in Bracknell uh, as a visiting researcher for a couple of months, Ooh, maybe, maybe 15 years ago, and I've always, I visited here once before, but, but this is actually my first extended visit here, and uh, I've been talking to, as I said before, a whole suite of different people uh, on a whole range of different topics. Uh, including, you know, science communication, including, um, you know, what your role as a public scientist is or should be, uh, as well as the scientific uh, interests that I have both personally and as uh, the, the, the lead investigator for our group. You know, they, they sometimes hear the term climate model. Mostly they don't, actually. Um, mostly they don't really understand how we use models in science. Uh, the, the word model itself is laden with so many different meanings that, uh, you know, with what I say and what somebody understands uh, are very often very different things. So uh, the, the larger issue is not the use of the tool per se, but the approach that scientists take to trying to understand something complex, right? So, you know, we have to have, uh, we don't have multiple Earths, right? We just have one, uh, and we're only doing one experiment. So we can't do that like you would do in a laboratory, you know, oh, let's just take another Earth and poke this one and not poke that one and see what difference it makes. So when you've got uh, lots of information about the real world, and you're trying to put it all into uh, context, you need to have tools, you need to have laboratories that, that you can poke and prod. And so we create those in the, in the, in the computers, 
in order to ask questions that anybody would ask if they were investigating something that's happened, like a, you know, like a, at a crime scene. You know, um, do, you, do you have CSI here? Sure do, right. yeah. So uh, the process that, that CSI uses to try and work out what's happened, right? You know, you have a situation and you're looking for clues, you're looking for fingerprints from, you know, this person there or that person there or this situation. Some of these have alibis, some of the evidence is confusing and sometimes it's contradictory and you have to work out what was the story that allows all of those pieces of evidence to fit. And that's exactly what we're doing. So when I talk to the people on the omnibus or on the tractor, I talk about those kinds of issues, uh, trying to find the fingerprints that are associated with changes in the sun, natural cycles in the ocean, uh, air pollution, carbon dioxide, all of these things. And then you kind of, with those fingerprints, you work out basically who done it. And sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. Right now we have, uh, and so we've got a, you know, kind of beyond reasonable doubt case uh, against uh, greenhouse gases and, and the greenhouse gases that mainly come from uh, fossil fuel burning. And people will get that. People will understand that process, that kind of investigative uh, approach, and they also understand that you don't know everything certainly. Right? You, you, you know, I mean, sometimes people uh, kind of casually ask you, oh, what's your proof that this is going on? And this notion that science provides proof as opposed to evidence is, is something uh, that you have to fight against quite a lot. Uh, but a lot of times people are just, you know, they're using words casually in, in, and so you can kind of work with them quite easily. The interesting thing about climate as a science is that a lot of people who are now climate scientists didn't start off that way. They started off as meteorologists or ecologists or oceanographers or cryosphere scientists or somebody who just liked to go and dig in the mud. Uh, and they've all kind of become assimilated into the climate science borg, if you like. And a lot of times they, yeah, that's kind of happened um, not quite unconsciously, but not deliberately. And so people uh, who are now all climate scientists are now expected to know everything about climate science. And so you end up with an oceanographer being asked about uh, paleoclimate in the, uh, in the Cretaceous. You have an ecologist who's being asked about radiative transfer in the stratosphere. And quite frankly, they don't always know the right answer. And so there's a communication that needs to be done among scientists who are interested in this particular field that is in between the very um, kind of high level popular science uh, aspect and their particular expertise that is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, an educated uh, but summarized view of what all the other elements in the climate science pantheon have, have put together. And so there's a, there's a need to communicate, you know, into climate science. Uh, and actually that helps with the communication to the wider scientific audience and the wider general public. Uh, because, you know, you, you, you need to synthesize and, and, and compress the information at each of those different levels. You know, you can't, you can't tell people, somebody asks you a question about climate science and you say, well, here's the IPCC report, boom, <laughs> right? You know, that's not useful. There's a lot of information there, but it needs to be synthesized and summarized, uh, but intelligently, you know, you can't, just, you can't just read the headline. So um, climate scientists, like any other group in the world, are made up of a whole range of people uh, who make mistakes and who do well at many, many different things. This, this notion that you know, we of all groups in the world have to be perfect at everything we do uh, is obviously, you know, if you just think about it, well, obviously that's not, that's not, uh, that's not an appropriate goal. Uh, 
So uh, communication science is always on a bell curve, right? You know, there's great science, there's mediocre science, there's you know stuff that's going to be wrong. Communication is the same way. There are great um, efforts to communicate that work really well and that really resonate, and there are things that are just you know just don't end up <laughs> don't don't work very well at all. Sometimes these things. You know, uh, people have done a good job with a with a an odd idea that just ends up being uh, a problem because they don't really know into what environment they're pitching it, and sometimes it's just accidental. You know, somebody says something off the cuff uh, in a in a in a in a long media interview, and then it gets blown out of all proportion because it resonates with something else that somebody has uh, either said or or, or, or is confused. Um, and uh, you see all of that. And then you see people deliberately taking things out of context in order to make the people look bad. And that happens because we're putting out information into a politicized environment uh, where, you know, the ideas of, uh, you know, an evidence, advance of evidence and uh, synthesis really don't apply. Whereas, it, you know, you're, you're putting things in into a situation where there are very strongly competing values uh, and people who want to use science to justify their values uh, and they often do it implicitly. And so you end up with, you know, politicians or talking heads, you know, picking scientific uh, nuggets out of nowhere and throwing them at each other on, on TV and really, it's just a proxy conversation for their underlying values, but it sounds sciencey. It sounds like you're that one side has science, the other side doesn't have science, and the other people are the worst people in the world, and these people are the worst people. In the world. And communi genuine communication efforts, in terms of like trying to help the public uh, understand, uh, can get completely swamped uh, by very, I mean, not literally loud, but but uh, dominant voices on television or in the papers uh, that cause, uh, you know, a, a great deal of, of, of confusion and, uh, uh, and problematic communications. We do education and outreach uh, at the high school level. Uh, we have uh, an organized program where we develop uh, curricular activities and um, lesson plans that are associated with, in the US, the national science standards uh, that uh, help people understand or help, help un uh, teach children uh, that you know, science is a process. It's not about getting the right answer. It's about kind of coming towards uh, the right answer. It's about you know, understanding the uncertainties. It's about kind of dealing with, the, you know, the, the situation that we started with, you know, like trying to find the fingerprints of different ele elements in the, in the system and then trying to work out why, why things have gone on. Do you think young people are more open-minded to um, looking at evidence than maybe an older generation? Uh, no, so I, I, don't think, I don't think young people uh, are any way different to older people in terms of their ability to process information. Uh, it's, but the, the base attitudes of people growing up today compared to people who grew up in the 1960s are different, right? We have different concerns, there's a different zeitgeist, there's a different kind of flavor in the air. Um, you know, I generally find that uh, younger people are much more environmentally aware uh, than, than earlier generations were. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, technology will fix everything, uh, which in the 1960s was a very prevalent kind of attitude, 1970s as well, then it kind of started to all go a little bit wrong. Like now, it's a very different attitude. Um, and how you feel about technology, how you feel about the environment, changes the way you process information about the climate or, you, or air pollution or public health. And, and so you see different generations, different groups processing that information differently and, and then kind of either reacting against it or saying, yeah, well, yes, and how can we deal with that? And that's really m much more a function of their, 
kind of underlying attitudes and values than it is their age particularly. So for most people, uh, they understand climate and when they hear the word climate, they hear the word climate change, they understand that through the prism of weather. And so uh, extreme events in weather, whether it's uh, heat waves, uh, extreme precipitation, hurricanes, droughts, floods, and the like, trigger questions in people's minds that, okay, well, is this climate change? You know, I've heard about this climate change business is now and this is changing, so are these things connected? And I think those are very interesting questions uh, to try and address. And I think both the people here at the Met Office and, you know, in our, in our institute and around the world are trying to address those uh, the specific questions. Um, and we're getting better at it. So, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, our ability to address how extremes might change, of all the very different kinds of extremes, there's not, there's, the extreme weather is not one thing. Right? Uh, our ability to address how that might change with climate change was very limited. Uh, our ability to, to look into that in more detail and find the fingerprints of change uh, in the data that we have has improved because we've got more data now. Uh, we have better understanding, we have better computers, we can do uh, a lot more tests that kind of really fill out you know, what's happening at the, at the ends of that bell curve. Right? Uh, and so uh, it's a question that we can now engage with more, and I think that that has brought that question kind of higher up the public agenda uh, as we've, as a scientific community, has also kind of got better at dealing with that question. So my views on the issue of advocacy have evolved uh, over the last... Uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, I think when you start off in science, uh, you kind of have this notion that you can just do your science in a little box and, and people are just gonna leave you alone and you know you can just do these things. And then, I, you know, I found that as I, as I kind of highlighted earlier, you know, my interest in science has, has followed where people are interested in the science that I do. And I'm going, okay, well, how can, how can I do things that are more interesting? Now, it's not that they're interested because of just some pure interest in the problem, right? They're interested because it's relevant to them. And when you're doing science that's relevant to people or to societies, there are inevitable questions about what your science means for a broader impact, for a policy, for uh, you know, how we should decide to do things. And so you end up with a situation where people are going to ask you, what do you think we should do about this or that? And you generally have an opinion uh, because you've thought about this for a long time uh, and it's not something that's new to you and you think, well, you know, I, I think uh, we probably should reduce emissions. Uh, do I have a particularly favorite technology to do that? Maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, do I think that people should know more about this topic? Yes. Do I think that people should make policy decisions in the full light of all the information they have? I, absolutely. Now, all of those statements that I just came up with, they're all advocacy positions. And there's a, I think there's a, there's a, there's a strange missing element when people talk about science and advocacy uh, in, in public um, because you, you, get, you get people who are totally happy to advocate for greater funding for their science. That's a very common thing. Uh, they're very fond of advocating for better education for, for children uh, and uh, better information for the, for the wider public uh, from the BBC or from, uh, from media sources. And then somebody says, well, I'm going to advocate for 
you know, a policy that is going to put a cap on carbon emissions. And these exact same people say, oh, no, well, you can't do that. That's, that's advocacy, not Brian science, Cox. for instance. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with Brian Cox about how he's such a great advocate for education and research and thinks that nobody else should advocate for anything else. Those are priorities associated with policies. You know, somebody has to allocate resources and money to greater education or to greater understanding. You have to think about that, and that's taking things away from other things, right? You know, there's not an infinite amount of things that you can do. You have to push for the policies that you want. And yet, when other people push for the policies they want because their science is associated with you know, environmental problems or, or clean water or air or something like that, He's, you know, oh, no, 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 that's advocacy. You can't do that. Now, I'm probably completely misrepresenting his actual thinking about that. But uh, so, I, so really don't make this about no, Brian Cox. We won't make a big deal about right. Brian. Then. Um, but that kind of attitude where people advocating for themselves is totally fine, but people advocating for the planet is somehow, uh, you know, a completely unethical thing to do makes no sense to me at all. So what I've been thinking about over the last few years is really how to encapsulate how scientists should think about advocacy. And I've gone back and, uh, uh, and I've, started, I, I've started reading you know, Walter Orr Roberts, who was the, the first head of NCAR, and Steve Schneider, um, and you know, other people who've been thinking about these things for, for many, many years. And I find myself re-concluding what they concluded in that what you, ha what you have to be is clear. What you have to be is precise in saying, look, this is the situation as is. This is the best that we understand of what is going on. Right? That's the science part, and that's where we spend most of our time. And then you say, OK, well, you know, my values are such that I like clean water. I like an educated, informed populace. Uh, those are things that I think that uh, would be, uh, the world would be better if we had cleaner water and more educated people. Uh, but that's a value judgment. You know, other people might disagree and they might think, well, you know what, it doesn't matter that people are educated as long as they're happy, right? That's a, that would be a valid value judgment, in which case you, you would decide to do something different with the information that comes from science, depending on what your values were. And I think a lot of the times, people are not very clear that when they advocate, when they say should, we should be doing something, whether it's education or carbon caps or uh, whatever, uh, that that is a combination of what is, what you understand about the science, and your own personal values. And I think that Steve Schneider was very, very good at this. He says, well, if you, can, you can be a, a responsible advocate, and you can say, look, here is what is, here are my values, this is what we should do uh, based on that, but I understand that that's my personal combination of those two things, right? You may differ. An irresponsible advocate would kind of hide all of that stuff about the values and just go, well, if this is the science, we should do that. And it's just driven by the science uh, without the intersection of your own personal values or your, uh, your political values or your religious values or your economic values in between times. And I think that that is irresponsible. Now, but that happens quite a lot because a lot of people don't examine why they're making that link between what is and what should be, right? Well, how did that happen? And I think by examining how that happens for you personally and for, and for the other scientists, I think we can end up being much clearer about what we're advocating for and why. And I think that that's a much, uh, that's, that's a much healthier environment uh, than pretending that we don't advocate anything. Because any time that I'm, I'm talking to you right now, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk on TV at some time, I'm going to be interviewed in a newspaper. Every time that I'm saying something in public, I'm effectively advocating for something. If I don't understand what it is that I'm advocating for, then it's certainly not going to be clear to anybody else. And in fact, you will just be assumed to be advocating for something else if you don't actually tell people what you're advocating yeah, the idea for. The of being able to do it, work in a total vacuum, is hypocrisy, isn't it? Well, it's not hypocrisy. I think it's just it's naive. Yeah. Right. Okay. It, it, I, mean, I mean, some people are hypocrites, but mostly people are naive. <laughs> okay.
Um, so I do work in the US. Yeah. Uh, the US has its challenges in terms of uh, it, its, its government structure, uh, which is extremely... Um, a big, complex, and uh, inertia-driven, oh. right? It's very hard to change things at the federal level, and that, it was designed that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, the political environment here is much more, uh, you know, the, the executive here has a lot more direct control on how things happen, and so, uh, but, but it's also much more centralized. The U.S., there's a lot of great initiatives at all the different levels of government, not just at the federal level, the state level, towns, cities, uh, regions, and there's a lot of things, uh, there's a lot of areas where uh, we can uh, add to the policymaking environment um, at all those different levels. And so we have a, a great uh, relationship with the New York City government um, in terms of uh, advising them on Plan NYC, which is a uh, both a, a mitigation and adaptation uh, strategy for climate change and environmental improvements going into the future. Uh, we've, uh, we've helped people with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast. We've helped uh, towns and cities uh, with um, you know, energy efficiency, green roofs, adaptation, all sorts of issues. Uh, those are relatively small, and so you know, the federal level does things bigger, but takes a long time to, to do that. Uh, and then the media environment in the US is very different to what it is here in, in the UK. It's much more decentralized. There are, uh, there's a profusion of uh, many more diverse voices. Uh, but then a lot of the television is really very, very shallow. And so you don't really have something that's equivalent to the BBC or like the think pieces that you would get uh, uh, on, uh, on Channel 4 or something like that. Um, uh, the audience for, you know, documentaries, uh, there's, there was a great set of documentaries on Showtime uh, in the US, uh, but made by Vice Media. Um, there was another set, uh, Years of Living Dangerously. You know, those are great documentaries, uh, lots of uh, very powerful voices, great stories. But, you know, the number of people that will see them will be in the low millions, uh, which is not a very high percentage of the, of, of the population. Uh, so it's a, that diversity of, of media sources for people and different voices uh, means that it's very hard to, to kind of broadcast a message. Uh, so you have to spend a lot more time thinking about how messages are passed, and you have to talk to a lot more people. So uh, over the last 15 years, the awareness of climate change as an issue and as, a, as an input into policymaking and uh, you know, life uh, has, in has increased enormously. Um, you know, it's been roughly 25 years since this has started to kind of impinge on the public consciousness. Uh, and, you know, I remember 10, 10 years ago, people would call me up and, you know, it would be, you know, a staffer somewhere or a journalist and, say, and they'd ask, so this climate change thing, is, is, that, is that real? Um, and you'd say, yes, yes, it's real. Uh, you know, is it, and yes, it's, it's mainly caused by us. And now I get questions that are actually much more sophisticated from a, from a wide range of, of people. And it's, how can, we, um, how, how can we fix air pollution and climate change at the same time? Is, you know, is, are, those things, uh, are those things kind of going to be opposed to each other? Or can we find win-win scenarios? Can we, can we do better? Uh, can we ask more sophisticated questions? And people are asking more sophisticated questions, uh, and that's at all levels. You know, people, people at parties are interested in attribution of extreme events, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, they're saying, well, what is this carbon dioxide thing, right? So I think there is a broader awareness of the problem and a deeper awareness of the problem, particularly in, uh, in, in, in areas where you've got decision makers. I mean, I, I don't think there are any decision makers uh, anywhere in the world who don't now have somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of climate. 
And that, that's a very different uh, thing. And I think that that means that it's inevitable that people will start factoring climate change into the decisions they make. Now, are they going to do that perfectly? No. Uh, are we going to um, you know, underestimate some of the changes, overestimate some of the other changes? Almost certainly. Are people going to you know, do enough or do too much? I think that you know, <laughs> both of those things will happen. Uh, but moving forward into the future, you know, as the climate change signal becomes stronger and clearer, uh, people will see that things are changing now. We had the, the National Climate Assessment that just came out in the US. That's a, it's supposed to be an every four-year thing, but you know, it, 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 for various political reasons, it hasn't quite happened that way. Uh, but that's a, uh, a, uh, a bottom-up assessment of where communities and infrastructure is vulnerable to climate change, where we've already started to see changes, where we've already started to see adaptations uh, to avoid the worst aspects of that. And it's, it's happening now. And it isn't something that's a far off thing that only your grandchildren need to worry about. They do need to worry about it too, but it's already happening, it's already there. And so I think uh, that will become increasingly clear, uh, not just in the US, but, but worldwide. And people will start making decisions, uh, taking that into account. You do need the detail to create the whole, and you can't, you can't just look at it uh, in a kind of new agey, holistic way. Oh, it's like uh, every, everything's connected to everything. Um, obviously, that's true, but the pieces that you're connecting are the fruits of like kind of classic reductionist uh, thinking. But the synthesis, that's kind of... It, if you think about science, you know, there's this tendency towards reductionism, smaller and smaller, more and more expertise. But then people forget that there's this countervailing tendency towards synthesis. And uh, you end up where you have these things that are pulling people apart, and then these things that are pulling people together again. You know, the fact that the, the problem is complex and does need all these pieces pulls people together in a way that, you know, reductionism on its own uh, would never do. Right, so uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle here, uh, trying to do the synthesis, which is basically pulling in all those strands and trying to make something coherent and making sure that that coherent thing is actually consistent with what we can actually see in the real world. So here the, the uh, system modeling thing, yes. which is being duly stepped up. So this, that is, do you see that's a really important area to fill in that gap with at the moment? And is that part of that same... Yes, uh, so Earth system modeling as a whole uh, is really just that synthesis. It's, uh, you, know, it, you know, the Met Office has obviously a lot of weather forecasts uh, information and, and it does a lot of atmospheric modeling uh, that's based on that. But, you know, there are elements of Earth system modeling that are coming into that, like trying to forecast where dust is going, where volcanic ash is, uh, is going, what the what the aerosol and the air pollution is doing as a function of the weather. All of those things are now being integrated even into weather forecasts, right? And that's that same synthesis that you see with Earth system modeling as a whole. You're trying to build, bring all of the elements that you can see uh, in the system into a, into a coherent thing. And so that's, um, it's not just our group that's, that's moving in that direction. The Met Office and the Hadley Center is moving in that direction. The same is true for MPI in Germany or or the equivalent uh, groups in Japan and France. Uh, these things are, uh, it's, this is inevitable. You know, we, we, the problem that we're looking at is a complex problem that involves multiple domains. You can't ignore that. You can, you can study small parts of it, but the reason why we're studying any of, it, any of it is to put it all together. And if we're not putting it all together, then we're not doing our job properly.